wanted to kind of talk a little bit about the notion of connecting leadership and sustainability, integrating some of the different uh, sessions that you've had. Um, and then really to me, it's, as I thought about it, digging into the questions rather than the answers is kind of where I want to take this conversation. Because we got a lot of open-ended, unfinished business and everybody's moving into unfamiliar places. And if I have a credential to speak about leadership, I don't think it's anything fancy that I've done. I think it's mainly just sort of that I've enjoyed blundering into undefined early phases of conversations and trying to figure out that early piece of work. And I think that's a, a fundamental thing. It's called leadership. It sounds romanticized, but I think a lot of leadership is the willing to sit with, with open-ended and unfinished business. Um, and a lot of that has to do with telling stories and knowing what's possible. Um, because what the notion of leadership has to do with bringing people into a space that's unfinished, uncertain, unresolved. Uh, and, and a lot of the way we process that is by having a mental story and having a conception that it's actually safe to move out of the unknown, to move out of the known and into the unknown. Um, and then, but within that, if you just keep telling stories, it becomes, uh, it can become empty and rhetorical. Uh, so the, the narrative arc, Patty asked me to kind of ground this in my biography a bit. Um, a lot of that, my personal journey over the last 10, 15 years has been going from vision and down into practice. And I think that that's a big piece of what this conversation is about as well. And so ultimately, I think the day, the time that you guys have together is about getting your cleverly uh, named, what is it, Sustainable Leadership Action Plan? S-L-A-P, slap. <laughs> Wake up, people, it's time for a slap. Um, so, okay, personal leadership is personal. So that's, you know, we, this is a conversation about personal leadership and sustainability, and that's kind of where we're gonna sit. Leadership implies direction. You're leading somewhere. Um, and to start to know where, you know, to go somewhere, you have to start by asking good questions. Where am I going? Why? How are we gonna get there? So I wanted to kind of ground us in questions, not answers. Um, and then the last point I wanted to just make is that sustainability is not an end state. It's not a thing. It's a path. It's, it's, a, it's a trajectory. Um, and it's continuous improvement. It's a lead standard that's always deepening. Uh, it's a bar that's always raising. So, and and that, the fact that it's a, a, that it's a trajectory, that it's a journey, has a logic to it and it has consequences. So if you're gonna be on a path of continuous improvement and deepening uh, and getting more serious, there's a body of work that goes with that. Uh, and I think that that's the responsibility of the leadership uh, discussion. And I think for you thinking that you have a kind of a set of a, a checklist or some guideposts as you're going out into the community, I love this sort of network of ambassadors, the peer groups you're gonna be forming. I mean, you gotta be asking yourself a continuous set of questions that kind of get you to, to conditional answers that are good enough for now to take the next step and the next step and the next step. Um, so I, you know, I'm speaking at a very high level. A, a few things also as I kind of tried to think broadly about this, this narrative, about this arc of leadership and driving sustainability, it's very particular to the moment you're in. What are the opportunities you have now with the people you touch, with the position you occupy, and how can you use those resources more effectively? A big piece of sustainability is a kind of an asset mapping sensibility. What are the things that are being underutilized that could be more fully utilized, more richly utilized? Um, you know, it, it will get into sort of talking about green jobs and the notion that there's sort of, there's no throwaway people, there's no throwaway places there, there's this kind of richness of these building blocks. Um, and thinking through, in this moment, how do you put those things together? And you have to value yourself and your, your unique position, and then figure out a set of choices that reflect this higher level of first principles and values, and, and be kind of tactical. You know, what can I get done? Um, so I wanted to throw, I don't want to do this as a full exercise. Um, I just, I get self-conscious with the formal exercises. So you're just gonna, I'm gonna throw up a list of questions and you guys can think about it later. But I wanted to throw some questions at you. Why are you here in this room? You know, internalize this. This is not about my biography. It's about us figuring out for ourselves what our narrative and our journey is. So why are you here? And what are you trying to accomplish? And why does it actually matter? 
Uh, and, and one of the most important things is, why do you love this work? What do you want? What, what is uh, affirming in this work? Because sustainability is about, it, it is about love. It's about a value proposition. It's about uh, more fully benefiting uh, the world. Um, and, you know, why do you need to? Where's the urgency? And then what does success look like? Um, so from that, you can kind of tease out a sense of purpose being focused on goals and the impact, but making sure that those reflect your own personal values, and then thinking about the capacity that you have and the resources that you need to start moving towards an end state. And this is not scientific, it just sort of, I threw out some questions, teased out some underlying propositions, and, and that's that slide. Um, so then I wanted to kind of just touch on, this is where it starts to bridge into me, because personal leadership is personal, you know, I was thinking about, you know, what was my motivation? And I think one of the things, one of the reasons Patty asked me is because uh, you could make a case that I've done a lot of interesting leadership. You could also make a case that I had a lot of fitful career starts that I sort of went down a path and then stopped and went in another direction. So I've got a lot of pieces that are uh, coherent if you understand the through line, but they're actually quite uh, thematically different. But the thing that is an absolute through line for me is an economic vision uh, about investment. Um, that what we're trying to do with sustainability is fundamentally about redirecting the economy and changing the way resources flow within the economy. And eco sustainability, environmental metaphors, are very important for where we need to go at a kind of a planetary level. It's about a metabolism of the economy where you're not producing toxicity, where you're not producing uh, you know, death and suffering, where you're, where you're not uh, squandering what you have. Um, and so that economic vision is about building a better economy. And the, another theme that I think is coherent throughout is that place matters, that specific places are where decisions happen, where investments are made. And so if you're thinking about the economy at a macro level, you have to think about the economy where you are. Um, and for me personally, you know, this is the sort of the comfort zone piece, but you know, for me personally, it comes from a faith and a values. You know, I grew up in, a, in a, a pacifist Christian tradition. That was my family, right? I was born into a Quaker family. And the notion of creative nonviolence as a path toward change, it, 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 I, I, ne I don't know how to comfortably bring it into talks because it, it is very personal, but, but the idea, uh, the Quakers ask, what are you doing to remove the occasion of war? Um, this is probably the most important thing to me, and so it's, it's a little awkward to say, but um, pursuing the absence of a negative is not a positive. Uh, and that's why I mentioned love, right? The, we're not talking about the absence of toxicity. We're talking about building a better economy, better places, better jobs, fuller, richer lives. And to me, that is the same spirit of creative nonviolence, of uh, of bringing yourself fully into your work. Um, and so that is really the point of departure. Um, going back quite a ways, there was 9-11 um, and uh, a, glo a recession and a need for stimulus. And I was in, um, I'd been working in uh, Vice President Gore's office. I was doing work on climate. Uh, there was no Gore administration. I ended up working with the AFL-CIO on economic development and how to kind of grow communities and do economic development. Um, and I found myself coming from an environmental background but being in a labor and an investment background um, and seeing uh, labor and environment at loggerheads continuously and a rift between jobs and the environment. And this gets to the question, what can you uniquely do in the moment you're in? And I was in a moment where the two things that I cared very deeply about were sort of at war and were constantly getting rifted by political fights. Um, and it occurred to me that a coherent vision of investment that built jobs uh, and said, okay, we've got this clean energy economy we want to build. What does that mean for janitors, for iron workers, for pipe fitters? And there wasn't a narrative at that moment. The, the narrative in the environmental community was mostly about uh, mercury, air toxics, uh, and regulations about, about power plants, or it was about uh, a set of things with cafe standards in Kyoto and Anwar, and things that were uh, felt very antagonistic to at jobs advocates on, on the, the labor side. And so 
with a, a nice, again, a community. I, I sort of built, we built a team together where we were having a conversation about a positive vision about jobs and the environment. Uh, an inclusive vision about moving the economy. We landed on this Apollo metaphor that we're a country that can do things, a vision of uplift. How do we roll up our sleeves, invest, build differently to benefit multiple attributes? And then there's the sort of spillover benefits concept. So then what did we do? We, we had to operationalize that. It was a political vision, right? This was a, this was a coalition building tool and an organizing tool. We came up with a 10 point plan and it was basically all about stuff you can build. Um, and it, it, what the labor side was doing really smart was sectoral economic analysis. They basically said, okay, I'm in janitorial work. How do I make these jobs better? How do I build skill ladders? How do I build trajectories for economic empowerment and consolidation of wealth and building workplace democracy? Um, what, the, what the environmental side had was a set of uh, a vision about interdependency and, and a set of things about using ecological metaphors. So we basically took the environmental vision and we broke it down into a sectoral strategy about certain pieces of industry, how does regulation play in. You know, some of the stuff has fallen out. People aren't talking about hydrogen cars by, uh, you know, anymore, but the manufacturing. Over the arc of the next 10 years, we we're actually able to get a lot of this work done because we made, uh, we made an intellectual framework for people to start thinking about discreetly how do I move each of these sectors. And I was really intrigued to go back and pull this old slide and see energy independence by 2015, and just to see how much time uh, has gone by. Um, and at the same time, there was a, a community of folks also at the community level. These are some pictures that I stole from Majora Carter, you know, a decade ago when she was in town, Van and Majora and uh, Van Jones. And there, there was a group of folks who were th sort of collectively were thinking about good jobs and green jobs. And this is a rooftop in the South Bronx, one of the poorest uh, congressional districts in the country. And it's about creating jobs and training and opportunity and creating nicer places. And I like this because the metaphor of a, of a green roof, treating the rainwater on site, creating a pleasing place, the cooling impact, the insulating, it's about spillover benefits. And it, to me, it says exactly the work we want to do. It's not jobs and the environment. It's like, if you're doing it right, uh, you're creating progress, increasingly more abundance. Um, and, and this kind of captures that for me. There's a flip side of it though. I, I hit a point and I think the community hit a point of sort of the, running into the limits of that piece of work and the, and the fear of overpromise and very, very powerful organizing and political, building political will. We got all the democratic presidential candidates, candidates in the primaries talking about their plan for, um, but then it ultimately, it comes down to, okay, so we're gonna get some money for a green jobs training program. Are there businesses to hire those employees? And the notion of an empty promise to a community as someone in need is, is a terrifying thought. Uh, and, and, and the ability to erode uh, the enthusiasm that you've built um, is, is a big danger. So at, at that point, I made a personal decision, and this gets to the question of, okay, what's your direction? And I really didn't want to be sort of pushing a political coalition that was about just kind of making space for political consensus. And I felt like what I needed to do was to dig down to the next level and figure out, okay, what does this actually mean? Um, that graph, so this is a book that I wrote with uh, Congressman Inslee, he's now governor of Washington State, a, a wonderful man, a serious climate leader. Um, we wrote this book where we just basically went through and we did that sectoral analysis and tried to kind of make it real, grounding it in industries. And it was an interesting opportunity to kind of go deeper into the narrative. On the left, um, those are the Princeton wedges. And if you're in climate space, they basically say we need a seven gigaton reduction, excuse me, of CO2. It's very hard to comprehend what a gigaton reduction is. Each of those things translates into, each of these wedges in the Princeton scheme translate to a lot of bricks and mortar, you know, vehicle miles traveled reduction. So it's a lot of transit, it's a lot of high speed rail, it's solar rooftops, it's windmills, it's green buildings. Um, and so the idea here was to tease out very concretely a specific investment agenda uh, based around the needs of society um, and then map it to uh, concrete investments and to industry sectors and to uh, economic opportunities. This is 
a schematic of a wind turbine showing bottlenecks in the supply chain. And thinking of a wind turbine not as a green technology, but as a, as a suite of, of capital investments in machined tools, manufactured products, and workforce jobs. So it was, it was an effort to take the political rhetoric and bring it into uh, a, an economic uh, framework and set of agendas and, uh, and requirements and, and so forth. Um, this is a, a bit of, a, of, a, of a, a lateral step in this, this narrative. But, so when we wrote this book, um, it was actually at the end of writing the book. We, I was, we were doing sort of page proofs and stuff. And we had this uh, woman who we'd interviewed who was a tribal leader uh, in Shishmaref, Alaska. Her name's Nus La Lucy Aningawak. Um, and basically, they were sort of frontline climate community. The community's falling into the ocean, and they had to spend some large number of millions of dollars to move the community back from the shore, because even small, uh, small storms were causing large sea level rises. And so we were going through the book, and we were putting illustrations in. Um, and I said, well, you know, that would be a good illustration. So I called Lucy in Shishmaref in northern Alaska, and I, and I said, we would love to have a photograph of what's going on there. And she said, um, OK, hold on. I'll send my husband out with a camera, and he can just take a picture and email it to you. And there was a, there was a personalization. Like, I was very much in my head about the abstraction of climate. And I was talking about a frontline community. But this was a woman who could step out the door with a digital camera and take a photograph of her house falling into the ocean. A climate crisis is unique in human experience, because usually doing nothing uh, is the safest and most predictable path. And the status quo is the path of least resistance. It's the most trustable path forward. And we're in a moment where we're pursuing uh, the status quo leads you to a climate crisis and, and really a catastrophe. Um, so that kind of elevates the urgency of this sort of trust and the positive vision, but also the understanding the urgency and how the two things fit together. And the need to have a vision about how uh, a sustainable path leads to mutually supportive mutual benefits, uh, and how doing nothing uh, really is exceedingly uh, costly and painful and unnecessarily wasteful and damaging. Um, <clears throat> and that, to me, again, increased the urgency. So now we've moved from a kind of a political vision that could easily be co-opted uh, and could be seen as empty rhetoric to a kind of a work plan for how do we get something done, but still fairly conceptual and macro. Around this time, I was doing uh, uh, an economic study, it was a long term, it actually, we just finally put out the full book just a few months ago in September um, uh, with an economist named Robert Pohl and a, a wonderful economist out of UMass, um, uh, actually from DC as well, part of our community. Um, we, and we realized Bush's tax cuts weren't really, really working um, and that we needed, that there was this, so we were doing this really long term study and we said, let's just do something about the recovery. And let's say if you shifted $100 billion from dirty to clean, what would it do? We put out this white paper and we basically said, you know what? Clean economy is more jobs, better jobs, more manufacturing, more construction, higher skill, better wages at all levels, regionally distributed. It's a better economy. Um, and then we put that out in September, and then we had a global economic downturn in October. And then in November, Obama was elected, and we have this total collapse, and people are running around building a recovery act. And it was just, it was part of, you know, it was dumb luck, um, but it was also being on the spot and having done some homework. And suddenly people were moving from a rhetorical space to a how do I do it space on the climate. A, a staff lead called me one day and said, Oh my God, my boss just gave a speech on the floor of the Senate and wants to spend $5 billion on rewiring the electrical grid. What can we do? <laughs> and it, you know, that, that's the moment you want to be in, right? If you're trying to do an investment agenda to re- And like, so we were sort of, you know, OK, this is a unique moment. How do we marshal resources? And so there was an effort from a lot of people. Again, it's about community, and it's about sort of framing an argument. Um, so there was a very systematic effort to find these shovel-ready projects that could go into a recovery act for transit, for high-speed rail, for weatherization assistance, for uh, advanced manufacturing of electric uh, batteries for electric cars, and really basically taking that whole, going back to the Apollo 10-point agenda, but now putting some dollars and seeing how could you push 
the resources that society spends year over year in a better way to jumpstart the economy, get it moving, but getting it moving in the right direction. This is just showing the blue dots are uh, what would have been spent in 2009. The gray, the light gray and dark gray are the Senate and House bills of the Recovery Act. So it's this sort of you know, thousand percent increase in spending uh, that happened uh, in, a, in a sort of to be spent over a 24 month period. It was actually having a moment where we could move into beginning an investment agenda. Um, and then this is just a comparison of the global. It, you know, we started getting calls from South Korea. The South Korea actually believed this stuff. And so they actually <laughs> went and built a green, a green Recovery Act. I mean, we did, you know, we did 90 billion, that's pretty good. Um, but you know, it was 11% of the Recovery Act was, was green. Uh, but definitely, you know, South Korea and China got, got I think, a little bit more kudos. So, so, um, so you get a Recovery Act, and then you get this hyper-politicized climate bill, and the whole movement is around um, a political fix and a legislative fix, and the legislative fix goes down. Um, and it, I think it was, a, you know, it was a big soul searching for people who cared about federal policy and for people who cared about, uh, sort of, you know, from the green community, the capital G green community. Um, the people who had the answers are the local practitioners, the urban planners, the mayors who were doing climate pledges, the university presidents, uh, investment bankers who were trying to have, figure out how to build portfolios to do the investment. There was still a huge amount of work to be done, but it was bottom up and it was about capital investment. Um, so then if you don't have an avenue, and this is like, what is the moment that we're in right now? You know, that's the question. You, if, and you know, we've been saying you know, that 2015 number is really sobering because at that time people were saying we've got 10 years to turn the ship around, it's a super tanker, it's hard to move. You know, we've been saying we have 10 years before devastating consequences for well over 10 years. So it's pretty urgent. So waiting for Congress, waiting for federal solutions is not relevant. So, um, I was, had the opportunity, because of where I was at Center for American Progress, to do a bunch of work with President Clinton and his foundation to start working with investors. Um, and we ended up making a commitment with the AFL-CIO, again, going back to this labor capital, caring about jobs, caring about people. Um, the labor movement uh, represent trillions of dollars of, of pension assets from firefighters and, and cops and teachers and uh, public employees. Um, and so the AFL-CIO was putting together this $10 billion commitment to move into clean energy and retrofits and investing in domestic jobs. And Obama asked Clinton to help put together this Better Buildings Challenge to do a voluntary initiative to move the real estate community. And just because of the relationships, and again, the community had the opportunity to work on behalf of the Clinton team uh, with the White House and kind of put together a voluntary initiative to move dollars, work with bankers, hotel owners, a whole range of folks. Um, but this voluntary space, the, you know, what is the, what is the pathway to action? Uh, I, it's, it becomes a way to move dollars. Um, so then this is a, a key kind of pivot point. For me, just as I had sort of had a, a crisis of confidence in the pure political and really needed to move into the specific questions, one of the things that I really like about President Clinton, he talks about being, says he's in the how business. And this notion of getting into the nitty gritty and figuring out how to actually operationally do stuff um, is something that technically he liked. And, that, and being in the how business, there was this thread as we were sort of talking up here about $10 billion of pension fund assets, you start to realize very quickly that there are not pools of uh, assets ready for institutional investors to buy. In a, you know, they need to spend $100 million at a time and they need to meet their ERISA requirements under pension regulation. It's got to be a sound investment meeting all these fiduciary risks. So this kind of granularity is now pushing you down into the investment thesis for actual institutional investors for how they move capital. And we discovered that there was a huge political will to move it, but it was not clear that there were financial products or vehicles or technical tools to actually put the capital to work, even if people wanted to do it. Um, so there is this through line, Patty was, you know, we have the Green Jobs Act that was passed, you know, going back a bunch of years, the Green Building Act that Patty and Green Home and Green Space really created. It was the first lead indexed green building law that was affecting uh, private uh, uh, buildings in the country. Uh, the Disclosure, Benchmarking and Disclosure Acts now that the District Department of the Environment's leading on. Um, we have all these market signals starting to build here that, that I think are very powerful at a bottom-up level that are leading making DC this hub. 
Around this time, I was working uh, with a number of other folks in the room on putting together a PACE financing program. We have now launched it. Um, we've, and this is, I've now actually quit my federal work and I'm running a financing program in DC and we're working with the Connecticut Green Bank. What PACE does is it uses a, um, a tax collection mechanism to secure, and this is where like your eyes glaze over. Right? I just, the tax collection mechanism. It uses a tax collection mechanism for your real estate property taxes to collect a secure repayment on a suite of green investments that save money and save energy and save water. Um, and so what it does at a very operational level is answer that investment challenge. Now that uh, pension fund can look through and say this is municipal debt. It's a tax bill, but it happens to be securing the greening of your buildings. So as a scaling mechanism, you now have a specific tool that's scalable that creates an asset-backed uh, form of debt that you can start to, to securitize and bundle and grow and you can start to think about putting those hundred million dollar pools of capital to work to really get this shift in the economy. It's a specific technical solution but there, at a moment when there weren't that many it's a very interesting one and it really gets into a very specific question about how do we change markets, how do we change investment patterns and how do we take you know in that binary choice if you're at a fork in the road and you have climate crisis and you have a sustainable economy that has uplift, if you can assume that if you, even if you have a lot of goodwill to get there, we've got to rewire the electric grid, we've got to rebuild our buildings, we've got to rethink how we structure our capital investments and how we manage our assets. And that, I think, is the fundamental challenge of the next five to ten years, is, is getting into that wiring diagram and finding specific solutions that start to move money at scale, that start to move resources at scale and change outcomes. Um, and so, to me, building PACE is finally an exercise on making good on a bunch of hopeful uh, but potentially empty promises that I was making a decade ago. Um, so, you know, if, if you're going to have integrity, you got to keep following it. And that's where this sort of adaptive learning, um, I think, is fundamental to it. There's a certain amount of courage, a certain amount of humility, uh, and, and just frankly having a, you know, a tough enough uh, skin uh, to, to wade into things where you don't know the answers, there is real risk, it may not work, um, and you're making some choices. Uh, but, but I think that these types of tools, and for me the capital investment solution um, is kind of the most exciting and the most direct to scale this. My personal, you know, went back to my first vision is it's an economic vision about building better places, investing differently. Um, but I, you know, I don't mean to disparage the communication side of this, right? Communicating the vision, that endures. Building the coalitions, that endures. Building the institutional capacity to respond differently or ask different questions of your balance sheet or of your employees or of your performance metrics on an annual basis. You know, any person in any job uh, with any particular set of personal predispositions, I think, can orient themselves to it. For me, it was about uh, a macroeconomic shift of dollars away from death and destruction and towards uh, justice and, and growth and, and hope and opportunity. Um, so then this gets to the thing, along with the, the DC PACE program, which if you are involved in any institutional properties, I encourage you, we can finance here, 100% financing. Uh, we can bring uh, capital solutions to actually do retrofits in DC right now. So there are tools and I want to actually not pass over that. This is an opportunity to actually drive retrofits without out-of-pocket payments and without um, an immediate capital cost to start realizing immediate net operating income. So there's a lot of real business logic here to pace and, and it is open enough. This is a project that I'm now working on. It's conceptual, it's not a commitment, uh, but we're moving rapidly down a path to build uh, a microgrid. Um, and, and one of the insights that came to me along the way, it, it was about that time when the climate bill was collapsing and, and um, the environmental community was saying, oh my God, we're stuck. We don't have a rule. And the, the key for me was we actually have to shift the way electricity markets work. And that it's very, very similar to disruptive technologies and disruptive infrastructure change that's happened many times before. If you look at IT and data, the same you know, decadal window, we've had a total transformation of telephony, of data management, of information processing, of, of many of our, our our physical infrastructure supporting decision and the economy have been fundamentally changed except for energy where there's a sort of legacy 
of a partially regulated utility, it's a little bit more stuck. But I would put to you that what's happening with climate and energy is actually the next wave of information communi communications technology change. And you're moving from mainframe computers to cloud-based uh, data systems. You're moving from very large polluting power plants to distributed buildings that generate and consume and store energy and are truly in a network. And this sort of network uh, engineering model is the relevant one for what we're building here. So the, the green economy is a better economy. Uh, you're not wasting resources. That translates very nicely over to what's happened in data. You know, you're, you're not wasting, you're, you're getting increased efficiency, productivity, uh, and resource asset value out of your, uh, your uh, energy systems, and you're not producing uh, waste. You're getting 90% efficient plug loads by having on-site micro turbines or, or combined cycle, uh, combined heat and power, instead of having 35% efficient, uh, you know, digging up mountains, boiling water inefficiently far away and sending it over copper wires for a very long distance, you end up with 35% of the coal to the, to the usable energy instead of 90% on site. So with Walter Reed, we have this laboratory and we're trying to figure out the business model, how to engage with utilities, how to deploy capital, how to serve customers and have it be reliable. Um, and you know, at, uh, within the district, this is a piece of the, the kind of the story of the hub, the district, you know, with the merger that's going on with Pepco and Exelon, with, with a lot of the leadership pieces that have gone on with very good leadership at Department of the Environment and DGS and, and uh, Deputy Mayor, there's an opportunity to build a series of microgrids around the district to take these um, sustainable business, uh, sustainable DC goals and make them real. These very deep penetrations of on-site renewables, very deep penetration of energy efficiency, elevating building codes. Um, but turning it into, it's not, just, it's not just a different outcome environmentally, it's actually a different economic model. And so one of the opportunities here, if we are trying to build a new economy, is that DC has the opportunity to be at the forefront of defining a, a more productive, uh, more substantively rich uh, economic model around the production and use of energy. The community solar, the work that, uh, that DC the sun is doing about you know, these solar gardens where you can own that virtual net metering. Again, it's a technical regulatory piece in the electricity uh, you know, regulatory framework, but it allows me as a consumer who's in a shady spot to own a remote solar panel. Someone can take a toxic waste site and put five megawatts and sell me my solar panel so my home is netted with what's being produced over here. It's a simple regulatory change that allows me to own both things and net them. Uh, but if I didn't have that rule, I couldn't have that benefit, and I would be still using coal, and that, uh, that farm would not get built because the capital resource of accessing my utility bill to finance it wouldn't be available. Um, so this, to me, is the most exciting. This is sort of the reward on the side of the risk of like, you know, this stuff may not work. It's, it, you know, it does make your eyes glaze over. It is more tedious than, than the sort of the exciting hopeful speech but it's also doing the work of getting it done. Um, so kind of going back to, to Patty asking me to kind of talk about, you know, starting with some biography, um, you know, the, the reason, I'm only comfortable doing it because it's, it's the flow of the, it's of the narrative um, of starting with a, a high level proposition and then drilling down on how to operationalize it. Um, and I think this is one example, this is the story that I can tell but you all have your own stories, and this is the process of you figuring out personal leadership in, in the context of uh, sustainable development. Um, I think we have to be digging into our own narratives, asking those questions, and being willing to do this adaptive process of, of changing course and finding what the richest opportunity is now, because I, you know, this, 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 this shit really is urgent. <laughs> you know, you gotta swear sometimes just to kind of, uh, th there's very, you know, we are at a bunch of a bunch of systems are sort of at the breaking point, uh, ecological systems and economic systems, uh, and and I think the fundamental truth about sustainable development or green jobs and the nexus of economy and environment uh, is becoming inescapable, and that is an opportunity. Uh, but I think it's incumbent upon us to be fast, uh, and uh, aggressive, and focused. Um, so that kind of comes back here to these questions, you know, what impact do I want to achieve? What intervention is most needed right now? What tools can I use to drive the change? 
and what's my plan? Um, and I think that tees up the notion of developing a sustainable leadership action plan. Um, and I think it tees up the idea of building these communities that are connected into a larger community. Um, and, and how do you, you know, the notion of this sort of asset mapping and understanding the resources and, and the folk, wherever you have influence in the need to go fast, uh, that is what's precious uh, because that's where you can drive change. That's where you can get impact. Um, and so being clear on the impact you want, the resources you want, and then making a choice about how you actually want to deploy your resources toward an end that's worthy uh, of the incredible amount of time and energy that it's going to take, and then to think critically, and if it doesn't seem to be working, uh, adjust and adapt. Um, yeah, and so this is what we showed at the beginning. Start with first principles, ask what this demands, recognize what you can uniquely offer, make choices that reflect your values, and be strategic in developing a plan. There you go. Thank you.